Hi, I'm Nick, and welcome to Storytime, Batman Nightfall. Batman Nightfall, the story of Bane breaking Batman's back and his replacement by Jean Paul Valley, is possibly the greatest Batman story ever told when you include Night Quest and Night's End, the reign of Jean Paul Valley's Batman and Bruce's eventual return and retaking of the mantle of the Bat. You will see Batman pushed to his absolute limit and beyond. It is truly a testament to his indomitable spirit, what he endures in these pages. This is not the tale of a hero's success, but of his greatest fall, and of the honor with which he faces his end. It does not end with his breaking, though, and you will also see the twisting and perversion of the incarnation which replaces him. In the letter columns of the time, some fans cheered on the brutal new version of Batman, while other fans bemoaned what had become of a once proud and noble hero's name. It was controversial and caused many to drop the books entirely. I think Jean Paul's Batman was meant as a parody of the worst and most prevalent elements of 90s comics, the amount of blades, guns, and psychological trauma only matched by the amount of unnecessary pouches and lethality. But that's all for later. This first part is only the beginning of a much longer tale, which I will eventually adapt all of. Nightfall itself will be three parts, each covering about eight comics. For now, Nightfall begins when Bruce has just begun to see a new doctor for his exhaustion from being Batman for too long. No human body was meant to endure what Bruce does, and it's starting to take its toll. It's the worst time possible for a new villain, Bane, to come on the scene, and he's determined to bring the Batman down, no matter what it takes. We'll begin three issues before the start of the event proper, as a lot of setup occurs here that we'll factor in later. Killer Croc roams the streets, remembering his lifetime of being shunned by society, and while he searches for refuge, Bruce meets with his new therapist, Dr. Chandra Kinsolving, at the Botanical Gardens. She tells him he needs to rest, and while his mind knows this, his body won't concede it. Neither hypnosis nor meditation has helped his exhaustion. She tells him to believe in her, and that her approach will combine the medical with the emotional and the spiritual, and she asks him to trust her with his soul, and he agrees. Later, Bane and his henchmen see Killer Croc on TV. Bird, one of Bane's three lieutenants, tells Bane that Croc used to be the kingpin of the underworld before reaching his current sorry state. Croc tried to prove his worth by taking out Batman, and if Bane is to rule Gotham, he must succeed where Croc failed. To prove his worth to even attempt the task, Bane decides to take on Croc himself. Bruce finally sleeps thanks to new sedatives. Jean Paul Valley is a young man who has come to train under Batman following the Sword of Azrael miniseries. He was raised by the Order of Saint Dumas, which his father served as the avenging angel Azrael, and his hypnotically placed fight training embedded in his mind, known as the System. Robin tells Paul he's going out tonight, and that he'll be posing as Batman while Robin takes the actual lead. Bane prepares to go out as well, while Croc creates havoc at a Gotham Mall. Croc lashes out at some mannequins, seeing them as jeering children, when Jean and Robin arrive to corral him. Robin uses gas while Jean Paul engages the beast, trying to keep his distance as instructed. You'll notice Batman and Robin are both wearing Death of Superman armbands. This was when Funeral for a Friend was running in the Superman books. Superman having died very recently. Croc's skin is too tough and this fight isn't having much effect. When Jean notices Bane on the monitor and in his distraction, Croc grabs him. Bane distracts Croc by challenging him and he forgets Jean Paul. Bane fuels his muscles with venom and when Croc swings at him he grabs his reptilian arm and breaks it easily. Robin collects Jean while Croc tries again to punch Bane but he dodges, his speed equaling his strength. Bane kicks Croc into a toy store window. Bane leaves Killer Croc crushed and defeated, and as he passes Robin, he tells him he is Bane, but that is not Batman. The disguise does not fool him. Gene is humbled by this experience as well, and plans to begin his training for real. Bruce tells Gene Paul that Gordon would know it's not him, and he resumes his duties. Gordon delivers Riddler's latest riddle to Batman while Bane watches the meeting from afar. Bane notices Bruce's slowing moving as if he's in pain. Bird tells Bane that Riddler isn't a physically imposing opponent. Bane has no use for puzzles and games, and plans to give Riddler an upgrade. Riddler awaits Batman in a bell tower rigged to explode, and he primes his device. Bane appears from the shadows and riddles him with small darts. He is dosed Riddler with venom, and for the next 48 hours he will be a muscle man. Batman solves the riddle and arrives with 10 seconds on the clock. His usual attack doesn't phase the Riddler, and he strikes back with venom-infused punches for two seconds. Batman dodges and counters as the clock ticks down, but he still takes a beating as well. 
Riddler ducks out as seconds tick down, and Batman must stop the bell from chiming and triggering the device. He's not sure if he's strong enough to hold it. Batman hangs on long enough to throw a batarang and take out the detonator, disarming the explosive. He then discovers the small darts and puts together that Riddler was drugged. Chandra discovers that Bruce wasn't even aware she was a recipient of his scholarship program, he had simply heard that she was the best. She tells him to rest, but he is bothered by the venom darts he found. Bruce once battled venom himself when his strength once failed to save a life, and he used it as a crutch for a time. He knows all too well what it can do. All he has on his side now are the sedatives. The Riddler has planted fish poison at the docks to be carried out with the high tide. Batman catches him leaving, and they fight in the surf. Riddler is beyond pain, high on venom, and his strength is tenfold. Batman won't let that stop him, and he continues to fight Riddler as the tide rises. Bane's henchmen, Bird, Trog, and Zombie, decide to send a message. They open fire from the dock, shooting the Riddler several times, forcing Batman to save him. Batman drags Riddler to safety, but is too slow to stop the escaping henchmen. He stops the poison from going out just in time. Bane's plan will come to full fruition with the breaking out of all of Arkham's inmates. He has stolen munitions both to break open the prison and to arm the prisoners. Bird tells him Joker is the one to break out first, the best to lead the assault inside. Bird's falcon carries nitroglycerin over the correct spot in a wall and by shooting a balloon it is dropped and the Joker is freed. A guard taken out by the bomb has dropped his gun which Joker makes use of to kill another guard. Bane fires a stinger missile at the center of the cell block and Joker frees the inmates inside. Joker keeps shooting guards as the inmates rush out. Bane blows a hole in the cell block wall with another stinger, and his henchmen lift off in a helicopter. Joker has made his way to Warden Jeremiah Arkham's office. From the chopper, Trog and Zombie drop crates of assault rifles into the yard of the prison. The police arrive and begin to enter the grounds, unaware they're walking into a firefight. The Joker has tied Jeremiah up to a shotgun that will blow his head off if he moves, asking if he feels saner now that he's restrained. Batman arrives on a glider and drops onto the blasted roof. Bane knows that Batman will choose to save lives rather than stop the flood of escapees, and he is correct. The orderlies have all holed up in one area. Batman intercepts the inmates heading back in with assault rifles to slaughter the orderlies. He uses smoke to disorient them and takes out all the thugs in ones and twos. Joker tells Arkham that all his improved security was for naught, as all that got him was the biggest breakout in Arkham's history. He says he'll enjoy the freedom of madness, the only freedom there is. Batman recloses the cells as Bane and his henchmen fire more Stinger missiles. They destroy the police blockade, and now the inmates have a clear path to the outside. They stream out into the night, Joker among them, while Batman has one batarang throw to try and free Jeremiah Arkham, and it must be perfect. The battering cuts the string, and Jeremiah is narrowly saved. Or is he? He babbles like a madman, as the inmates flood the Gotham Knight with raucous cries and gunfire. All of them will be loose to create chaos in the city, and with Batman already weakened, it will be his greatest challenge yet to contain them. Nightfall has begun. Nightfall, Part 1. Crossed Eyes, Dotty Tees. Batman and Robin look over the list of Arkham escapees. Both major and minor villains fill the screen of the Bat computer. Bruce asks who did this to him? Who broke them out of Arkham? The Mad Hatter and his pet monkey rob a hat store. Batman hears the call go out, and knowing the odder the crime, the more likely they are to find an escapee. He and Robin race to the scene in the Batmobile. Meanwhile, detectives Harvey Bullock and Rene Montoya look over the same list of escapees. Nine incidents already and six dead, and they have nothing to show for it. Gotham is in chaos, and they too are trying to look beyond the chaos to see a larger plan at work. While stealing the hats, Mad Hatter caught a glimpse of Bird's Falcon, and had the monkey place a tracker on it to see who was spying on them. At the hat shop, Batman finds an invitation to a tea party. The Hatter has invited several lower level thugs to his meeting, and after demanding the guests all put on the hats he left for them, he induces the trance and they become his puppets thanks to circuitry in the hats. He sends the film freak out on a mission. As they reach Tenille Estates, Sir John Tenille being the illustrator of several Wonderland books, Batman is visibly tiring. He insists to Robin that he's fine, and tells him to stay out of danger. He's back up. Meanwhile, Bird has found the tracker on his falcon and destroys it. Zombie sees someone looking around outside. Film Freak was following the tracker. 
Batman makes his appearance at the tea party as Bane prepares to deal with the intruder. Batman asks the Mad Hatter a film freak is part of Bane's plan too. Hatter only asks him who Bane is, and Bane responds through the hat receiver, telling Hatter that his man is dead. Angered, he triggers the hats to simulate the thug's adrenal cortexes, and they fly into a rage. Bane ducks behind a trash can as Film Freak opens fire. Hatter pushes Batman at the thugs, saying now is the chance he promised them to kill the Batman. Robin wonders how long to hold back. Bane throws a trash can at Film Freak and tackles him. Robin sees Hatter going for a machine gun and decides he's held back long enough. Bane breaks Film Freak's arm as Robin joins the fray, jumping on Mad Hatter's back. Hatter's monkey jumps on Robin though, and Hatter fires the gun. Batman dodges and throws a batarang, knocking the gun away. Bane headbutts the unconscious film freak. Batman tells Robin they're controlled by the hats and they both start knocking them off. Hatter goes for his gun again. Bane kicks film freak as Batman uppercuts the mad hatter. Through his hat radio, the film freak's final scream can be heard as Bane snaps his neck. Bane throws the freak out with the garbage, saying he's dead just like the Batman. Robin tells Batman he's wrong, they'll get him first. Two down, Hatter and Film Freak. Only the rest of the madhouse to go. Nightfall, Part 2, Puppets. Following the breakout at Arkham, criminals filled the night, headed for Gotham, not knowing or caring who had freed them. The ventriloquist uses his sock to create a puppet, whom he names Socko, to help guide him in his search for his Scarface puppet. He gains the trust and help of Amygdala, a large and confused man with the mind of a child. That was last night. Now Batman and Robin find the corpse of Film Freak. Almost every bone in his body has been broken, and he was beaten to death with someone's bare hands. Robin sees Bird's Falcon and says that some of the escapees may be looking for them already. Batman would rather be more active than reactive, but there's no pattern yet. They have to move fast. The really dangerous ones will be the ones who have time to plan. The ventriloquist asks for help finding Scarface in an underworld bar, and they laugh at his face. They stop laughing once Amygdala enters, though, and beats all of them to a pulp. Batman hears a call on the radio for a break-in at a toy store and races to the scene. Batman orders Robin to wait outside and he goes in alone. Robin sees the Falcon again and decides it's not a coincidence. Batman's relieved to see it's only the ventriloquist and asks him to come quietly. His new puppet warns Batman there's a monster behind him. Amygdala grabs Batman in a rage and lifts him over his head. Meanwhile, on the roof, Robin confronts Bird. Batman is thrown into the shelves of toys and executes a handspring kick to knock Amygdala away. Robin nabs the falcon in his cape, but Bird punches him. He backflips away and kicks Bird in the face. Bird and Amygdala both take the upper hand as Batman is smashed into a train set. Amygdala clutches his head in pain and Batman knocks him out by striking a nerve cluster. Bird is ordered to retreat and Robin gets a reprieve. Batman is so exhausted he forgets to bring in the ventriloquist as he limps out to the Batmobile to find Robin's note. Already the call is coming over the radio. Hostages have been taken by Zaz at a school. Nightfall, Part 3, Red Slash. Racing from my grave. Already dead. But I can't rest. Not after the Arkham breakout. Thirty-odd murders already, and all the work of minor madmen. Of the four major ones to make a move, the Mad Hatter and Amygdala have been captured. The ventriloquist is still at large, and the film freak himself has been murdered. It's barely begun, but the grave is rushing closer. And now... <sharp inhale> Zaz, serial killer, recently escaped from Arkham. Hold up in the Bates School for Women. Hostages. Send tactical squads at once. No rest. Not for the wicked. Nor for those who dare deal with them. Should be gone after the one behind it all. The stone cold center around which all the rest rages. Bane. But to reach him, got to fight through the storm itself. Chaos perfectly orchestrated with a single master stroke. Free the madmen. Free the monsters. And let them run wild. Zad displays his body to his terrified hostages, covered in hatch marks each line representing someone he's killed. The police had the school blockaded, but the two men they sent inside were caught and killed by Zaz. Two more marks on his skin. One of the girls insists if they all fight him, they can win. Bird is watching the school and reporting back to Bane in his hideout. Bane says that Batman may be physically weakened, but his mind is still strong. He's not yet ready to be broken. 
so that when Bane does it, the pieces stay broken. Zaz throws down the bodies of the two cops, saying that for these two transgressions, two hostages will pay with their lives. But Batman has finally arrives, and he tells the police no more moves. He's going in. Batman engages his night vision lenses and begins searching the floor Zaz was on. As he opens the door, hands jump out and grasp his neck. It's Robin. Batman says they'd only get in each other's way in the dark and tells him to leave. Robin says he's met one of Bane's henchmen, Bird, and has attacked Falcon, and as if he should follow him. Batman tells him not to confront Bane. Zaz informs his hostages that two of them must die for the police's actions. As he selects one, only the girl whose idea it was to attack him does so. He easily overcomes her and selects her as number two. Renee Montoya bursts in with a gun, but she doesn't dare risk the hostage's life by shooting. Mayor Kroll blames Gordon for not shooting to kill at the breakout, and he's holding Gordon responsible if any of the students are hurt. Montoya offers herself in place of the hostage, and Zaz accepts. It does no good, though, as she's only saved one of the girls, and now he needs a third for Renee's transgression. Just then, Batman breaks in through the window. Zaz says that he and Batman are alike, both hunters. The only difference is their choice of prey that Batman doesn't kill. But now Batman must know what it's like to be hunted. The breakout at Arkham means someone has it in for him. From the fatigue on Bruce's face, he sees that he is right. Batman asks him what Bane's plan is, but he knows nothing. Renee headbutts Zaz and stomps on his foot, freeing herself and giving Batman the chance he needs. Batman chases him into the dark hallway, but finds nothing. Zaz is hiding atop a light fixture and jumps down, slashing Batman's cape. Batman kicks him into a classroom. Zaz throws his knife, but Batman blocks it with a glow. He hurls it at Zaz and blocks his high kick as he rushes in. Batman throws Zaz into a desk and jumps on top of him. Zaz tells him to finish it and kill him, and Bruce flies into a rage, beating Zaz and screaming that he's not a killer. Detective Montoya has to stop him before he makes himself a liar. Bird reports to Bane that Batman did it again, but this time he looks whipped. Nightfall Part 4 Crocodile Tears Killer Croc has taken refuge in the sewers, hunting rats to survive. His broken arms were set in cast at Arkham, but he was released in the breakout. He dreams of taking revenge on the man who broke them, Bane. Above, Bane enjoys the terror he created on the streets of Gotham. The streets are empty as people cower indoors, and Bane revels in their fear. Bird reports back on Batman's deteriorating condition. Bane wants to let him run more of the gauntlet to learn the extreme limit of his endurance. Robin watches them from on high in the rafters. The daytime passes and Batman has passed out on the roof of the girls' school as Zaz is taken away by the police. Robin is unable to raise him on the radio. Bird wishes Bane had let him take out Robin, and Bane says the job is his later if he wants it. He's preoccupied with choosing the precise moment to make his final move. Robin has to decide on his own what to do when the gang splits up, and he elects to follow Bane onto an elevated train. Robin loses sight of Bane as the train becomes a subway and he switches to night vision lenses. Bane sneaks behind him and Robin is captured. That night, Batman is awakened by Bullock with his flashlight. He tells Batman he's not looking so good. But Batman has to go and find Robin. Bullock thinks Batman needs to sleep. Robin can take care of himself. He'd better be right because when Robin awakens, he has his hands tied and is blindfolded, and he's perched precariously on a narrow ledge in the sewer. Bane says that he knows Batman, but Robin is a wild card. He asks about the pretend Batman, and he says that he was being nice by blindfolding him. It would have been easier to simply blind him. He admires Robin's defiance, his youthful struggle against fear. Robin tries to find his bearings on the narrow ledge. He tells Bane that he's no hostage. Batman won't fall into a trap on his account. Robin tries a jump kick, which Bane easily catches. Robin says he'll only tell Bane one thing about Batman. He's beaten guys to make him look like a Girl Scout. Bane slams him into the ledge. Robin gets back up, and his blindfold is then removed, but by Killer Croc, who wants to know where Bane is. Robin's hands are still tied, and he tries to get out of danger as Bane leaps down from a pipe and attacks Croc. Bane and Croc trade blows, and Croc manages to break Bane's venom device, somewhat evening the fight. Robin manages to slip his legs over his arms and use his R emblem to cut his ropes. Croc seems to have the upper hand on Bane. But Bane fights back and breaks one of Croc's arms again. The bridge gives way, and all three fall into the rushing water below. Bane and Croc continue to fight each other as they are all drawn into the tunnels, which might run all the way to the harbor. Nightfall, Part 5 
Night Terrors. Robin tries to fight the current and avoid being swept under. He uses his retractable staff to catch the arch of the tunnel, giving him time to try and throw his emblem in a line. It wraps around a grate and Robin's able to pull himself to safety. Bane and Croc continue on through the sewers. The Joker visits Cornelius Sturk, a hypnotic madman who is obsessed with harvesting norepinephrine and adrenaline from the hearts of his terrified victims, and he has a proposal for him. At Wayne Manor, Bruce apologizes for canceling another appointment with Dr. Kinsolving. He hangs up on her when Alfred tells him Tim Drake has returned. Batman tries to figure out why Bane would be fighting Croc after breaking him out of Arkham. Robin suggests maybe there is no master plan. He was fighting the Riddler too, after all. Maybe the plan is just chaos to run Batman ragged as he tries to contain it. Batman is sure there's more to it, and in any case, not trying to stop the chaos isn't an option. Robin suggests maybe letting Jean Paul and him share the burden, but Bruce says that Bane is after him, and as long as he can stand, it's his task alone. Alfred thinks they're both nuts. Bane lost Croc and is back in his hideout. The news reports that Batman's encounter with Zaz may have destabilized him mentally, and Bane observes that the erosion of his body is now also affecting his mind. The plan is working. Zombie provides him with a repaired venom feed. Batman uses his computer to find sightings of famous dead people, the calling card of Cornelius Sturk. He races for the area in the Batmobile. In another part of the city, Scarecrow searches for the Joker in a pool hall. He uses his fear gas to make a thug see his greatest fear, and he sees himself balanced on tall pool cues above a great height. The man tells him Joker's plan is to kidnap and control Commissioner Gordon and use him to control the whole police force. Scarecrow snaps a pool cue. The sound triggers the cues in the man's mind to break, and he passes out in fright. In the hub, Batman hears the sound of Sturk's cart near a corpse, which he uses to dispose of bodies. He catches Cornelius Sturk going into his apartment building, but he's too late to catch him. Luckily, he has scrawled his plan to kill Gordon, and Batman races to the bat signal. At Gene Paul's apartment, he trains hard. Robin is worried about Batman, and Gene swears he'll be ready to help when they're needed. Gordon meets who he believes is Batman by the bat signal and begins to tell him the mayor plans to call out the National Guard, but it's actually Sturk using his hypnosis. He attacks Gordon with a knife, much to Joker's chagrin, who is watching with binoculars. The real Batman knocks the knife out of Sturk's hand with a batarang, and Sturk pulls a gun. Batman pushes Gordon down as Sturk fires, and hits him with another batarang, though missing the gun in his exhaustion. Joker declares this plan a complete disaster. Batman punches, chops, and kicks Sturk into submission, and Joker is met by an unknown ally. The Scarecrow has found him, and he's offended Joker went for the help of an amateur in fear when the Master was available. He proposes they team up, but the Commissioner is too small scale for the likes of them. He suggests they kidnap and control the Mayor instead. Joker's thrilled with the idea. It will bring even more fear and chaos to Gotham. Batman tries to calm Gordon, still under the influence of Sturk's powers. He raves that Batman killed him as his wife, Sarah, comes and collects him. She yells at Batman to leave her husband alone. He's brought him nothing but trouble. Batman broods. Everything is collapsing, and the big ones like Joker and Two-Face haven't even made their moves yet. Joker and Scarecrow are making that move that very night, however, and they use Scarecrow's fear grass to terrify Mayor Kroll after Joker has killed all his guards. With just a few phone calls, they can bring the city to its knees. Nightfall, Part 6, City on Fire. Scarecrow and the Joker terrify Mayor Kroll into making another phone call. They've already made him cancel the request for the National Guard and blame Gordon in the newspapers for the Arkham breakout, but Scarecrow wants to cause some real damage. They decide to make the mayor call the fire department and cut the rolls, causing a strike. It's awful timing as the arson-obsessed Firefly is burning down an amusement park at that very moment. Firefly, a.k.a. Garfield Linz, burns not for profit but for pleasure. He is addicted to causing and watching the fires. Batman again insists on going in alone. He swings from a burning roller coaster to confront Firefly on a higher track. Firefly blasts Batman with his flamethrower, and Batman blocks it with his fireproof cape. Firefly now has wings which lift him on the thermal updrafts. The track is collapsing, so Robin throws a line for Batman, and he slides down it. Robin tells Batman he's pushing too hard, and Bruce says that he has to. The police can't handle this. No one else can. No one knows the villains like he does. God help him. He knows them. 
Batman agrees, though, to let Robin handle Firefly and do the background research to try and find his pattern. Several calls from Dr. Kinsolving while you were out, Master Bruce. And you told her? Only that you were far too busy driving yourself to exhaustion by gallivanting about the streets in a mask and boots to speak to her. I'm in no condition for humor, Alfred. Excuse me for saying so, but you're in no condition for much of anything. A hot shower and breakfast is all I need. In addition to sixteen hours sleep, a three-month vacation, a blood transfusion, and a full psychiatric examination. Too much noise. I can't hear you, Alfred. Not that you ever could. And where is Master Tim this fine afternoon? Running down some background for me. The Riddler mails his latest riddle to the police, but in the chaos it goes unnoticed. His men have just about had it with his need to send these riddles. He plans a good job, though, so they tolerate it for now. On a rooftop, Batman fights the Cavalier, a fanciful swordsman. A lightweight thug, but it still takes everything Batman has to put him away. He leaves him tied for the police and goes to check out locations from Firefly's past that Robin has found. Firefly is burning down locations he wished he had been taken as a child in a Gotham orphanage. The Majestic isn't even a theater anymore, but that doesn't matter to Linz. He takes to the sky when Batman confronts him. Not thinking, just acting, Batman leaps and grabs Firefly around his waist, and they both fall back down into the fire. Nightfall, Part 7 Strange Bedfellows Batman and Firefly fall into the burning furniture warehouse and Batman releases Firefly. He catches a thermal updraft and rises, and once he has enough lift, Batman fires his grappling hook and catches Garfield's leg. He cannonballs at the end of the line, smashing through a burning wall protected by his cape. Firefly burns Batman's line and he drops, and as he falls he barely manages to wrap his line itself around a fire escape, and he crashes into it painfully. Firefly escapes, as Gene Paul goes out on his own in a temporary costume Robin made for him resembling a ninja, determined to prove himself. Alfred tells Bruce that tonight's charity function shouldn't be missed, or else people might correlate Batman's wearing thin in the media with Bruce's disappearance. Bruce agrees, and for a moment Alfred has hope, but Bruce says that one of the escapees is bound to strike the event. In one mask or another, he has to be there. Alfred says he'll wake him as late as possible. Bruce is correct, as Poison Ivy is planning to strike the event, and has an army of mind-controlled zombies she calls Dead Fellows. Watching her, Bird tells Bane of Ivy's plan, and he says he'll be there to observe. Joker and Scarecrow continue to terrify the mayor, and this time they're going to send the police into a trap. Chandra tells Bruce he's actually looking feverish now, but he insists he's fine. Bane takes one look at Bruce Wayne and knows he's the Batman. Bird is incredulous, but Bane says he knows Batman. He can't hide, so he's simply removing his mask. Bruce notes the lack of police. They received a call from the mayor claiming to be held prisoner at an abandoned amusement park. Every cop in the city is headed there. Bruce noticed Lucius begin to babble and barely gets his nose filters in before he too loses control. The room is lulled into a trance though and Ivy makes her entrance. She gathers only the men and leads them into a large truck to take back to her lair. Bruce plays along, pretending to be in the trance. The police hear the Joker's voice coming from inside the amusement park. Jean Paul Valley comes across a break-in and jumps down on the thugs, brutally knocking them all out. He's violent, but effective. Poison Ivy welcomes her prey to Neo Eden, a large concealed greenhouse, and prepares to rob them. Bruce slips away out of line and changes into Batman. He prevents Ivy's deadly kiss with a batarang, and she orders her dead fellows to attack. Five large men under Ivy's control grab Batman. He backfists two of them and throws a third off his back, hurling at Lucius Fox to stop Ivy's kiss again. Bruce roundhouse kicks two zombies and lashes out twice more, striking two more with each movement. With a haymaker and a flying jump kick, Batman finishes off the dead fellows. The shock of impact runs up his spine, making him wobble when he lands. Ivy tells Batman there is no antidote, they're all terminal cases. Without her kiss, they'd have died days ago. She asks Batman if it's finally time to surrender, but he knocks her out. He won't surrender to a witch. Batman calls for ambulances for the charity guests. From inside the abandoned amusement park, the police can hear the mayor being tortured. The SWAT team rushes in, only to find a tape recorder and a bomb. It explodes, killing several Gotham police, and the Joker and Scarecrow celebrate. Trog asks, why not let Joker take Batman out if he can? Bane says that no, Batman is his to crack, and his to break. Nightfall, Part 8, Burning Questions. 
Riddler's men have finally had it with him and his riddles. The job is planned and ready, and they're done waiting for him to send his riddles. They're just going to do it without him, and Riddler's men chase him away with bullets. They know he won't simply go tell the cops the plan, because it's not in his nature. What Riddler does do is try and find a way to get his message out to the people, and he passes a television in a store window. Robin is mad that Bruce is handling Firefly without him, after he did all the legwork. Alfred says, Denied the opportunity to confront a psychotic arsonist. I can only imagine your disappointment. Batman enters the Gotham Zoo, the last location on Robin's list. Garfield is out to burn down all the places he never got to go as a child, but he's no victim. A tortured childhood is no excuse for becoming a monster. Bruce knows. While watching TV, Robin sees Riddler take over a late night talk show with dynamite strapped to his chest. He asks the people what letter is never found in the alphabet. What does a ball player like to be called at home? What travels around the world but never leaves its corner? Robin rushes off to the studio. The zoo is filled with the terrified sound of the animals as it burns. Batman confronts Firefly again on a rooftop. Lynn's douses Batman in flame. Even through the cape, the heat saps his strength. But he's not burning. Fifteen layers of Nomex and a rebreather shield him from the worst of it. Batman tackles Firefly off of the roof. Riddler has taken a seat on the stage and asks the host if he thinks they'll win the ratings battle that night. He asks another riddle, what starts with a P, ends with an E, and has thousands of letters in it. The police have a sniper on the scene, but Riddler is holding a detonator that goes off if he drops it. No one sees Robin slip in. Riddler's men are of course robbing the safe at the post office, which has over a million dollars in blank money orders, stamps, and cash. Batman and Firefly land in a panther exhibit, and only Batman's helmet saves him from two-inch fangs. The panther's claws shred the Nomex like paper. Linz leaves the flying rodent to be eaten by the cat and flies up again. Batman discourages the giant cat with a halon, a fire retardant. He runs for the fence, readying a batarang in a line. He vaults over the fence and up at wall, throwing the line around Firefly in the air and pulling him down. Firefly hangs mere feet above the alligator enclosure, but Batman is too tired to even pull him up right now. Robin leaps out from behind the set and kicks Riddler, spraying his detonator hand in quick-dry epoxy. Bullock chastises him for his rash action, but it turns out the bomb was a fake. Riddler tells the cops to figure it out for themselves what the score was. Maybe next time he'll try multiple choice. The robbery of the post office is intercepted by Huntress, though, and she fires arrows into the thugs and knocks them all out. Firefighters have arrived at the zoo. Batman counts eight down, but he's exhausted beyond belief, and the really dangerous ones are still in play, like Scarecrow and Joker. How can he stand against them when he can't even stand up? Who will stand between Gotham and Bane? Nightfall, Part 9, Die Laughing Beaten, bruised, but unbroken, Batman staggers away from the zoo as the media arrive. The news reports that the fire is under control, but Batman looks much worse for the wear. Joker and Scarecrow see this and decide to lay a trap for Batman. Batman has a new suit but no sleep, and he races to the mayor's mansion to search for clues. Bullock decides to go in ahead of the bomb squad, and Batman narrowly saves him from the booby-trapped front door. No one is hurt here, but Joker and Scarecrow are headed for the Gotham River Tunnel with the mayor. Using a missile launcher, Joker blows up several vehicles to block one end of the tunnel after he and Scarecrow are inside. He fires a heat seeker down the length of the tunnel. Hottest engine wins and the explosion collapses the tunnel, blocking the other way in. He assures Scarecrow he knows a good escape route, and once they force the mayor to call in his location, the trap is set. The call goes out over the police radio, and both the cops and Batman rush to the tunnel. Bane says that with more discipline, Joker and Scarecrow could take the city. In any case, he says that once Batman deals with them, he will run their gauntlet. Batman tells Gordon he knows that it's a trap, but he's been in traps before, and he goes in. Batman is exhausted. Every step is uphill, but he can't stop. Not with the Joker just ahead. Batman finds the Scarecrow and attacks him, getting a face full of fear gas in the process. Batman sees his worst fears which already came through with the death of Jason Todd, the second Robin, at the hands of the Joker. That was only a few years before this. He fights through the visions to get rid of the gas, and headbutts Scarecrow. He reminds himself the visions aren't real, but Jason is dead. Snakes, Mayor Kroll, serpents, vipers, venom, and fangs, Sss, rattlers, what? Just a boy, good at heart, more brave than a man. 
too brave to become a man. Jason. Jason. Just a boy. His parents felled in blood. His own life ripped and torn from the world he protected. Jason. Just a boy, but never to breathe, speak, or move again. Jason! Just a boy, but far too brave to face the stark, lurid madness of a grinning killer. Jason! Just a boy, dead, but to his killer, nothing more than a sick joke. Just a boy, but forever gone. Jason! Scarecrow stumbles to the missile launcher and fires it at the crazed Batman. He dodges and the missile strikes the roof of the tunnel. The roof begins to collapse, the river behind it. Joker says Batman can either stop them or save the mayor. No way will Batman let Joker kill someone else. He heads up the ladder to the mayor while the villains escape. Batman jumps down the lair with Kroll on his back. As they run through the tunnel, the roof gives way and the Gotham River floods in. Nightfall, Part 10. No rest for the wicked. Batman holds tight to Mayor Kroll as they are carried by the rushing water. He grabs a ladder on the wall and asks the mayor to hold on while he finds a way out. The river will fill the tunnel in moments. The only way out is below the water line. Mayor Kroll isn't a weak man. He's a strong man pushed beyond his limits. All men have limits. Batman ignores his. He finds the tunnel he's looking for. Batman surfaces and gives Mayor Kroll a knockout gas and wraps him in his cape which will store a few minutes of air around him. He swims with the mayor down to the tunnel. His rebreather is exhausted so he's down to the four minutes of air he can hold in his lungs. The service tunnel may lead to the riverbank or to nowhere. The tunnel behind them is full. Batman tries to wrench open a hatch while the air pressure builds around him, the service tunnel quickly filling with water. The hatch is rusted shut. Batman keeps trying, unwilling to let it end like this, at the hands of the Joker. No. Bane engineered this. That's who wants him dead. Bane. The hatch finally gives. Batman leaves Mayor Kroll on the shore for the police to find, and they say they'd almost given up. He tells them that the Batman never gave up. He doesn't know what it means to surrender. Bruce's vision is blurring. He's lightheaded and beginning to shake. The hatch took the last of his strength. He just has to get to darkness and rest while he has something left. But Bane's henchmen will stand in his way. Batman sees Bird's falcon, but he doesn't see Trog dropping down behind him. Trog lifts Batman and throws him off the roof. He lands and knowing he's in no condition to fight must rely on his arsenal. Trog gives Batman a bear hug which breaks a rib. He headbutts Trog, giving him space to use his own version of tear gas on him. They fall off the roof. Knocking out Trog as Batman lands painfully. Breathing makes the broken rib hurt. He locks the pain away in his mind, ignoring it. A knife suddenly appears between his fingers. Zombie makes his move, throwing more knives which Batman flips up to avoid on pure reflex. A dark bat shape descends toward Zombie and he's ready with a knife. It's just an empty cape and Batman is snuck behind Zombie and trips him from below, knocking him out. Bruce smiles, despite the pain and exhaustion. That felt good. The Falcon attacks, slashing at Batman's arms. He runs away, crashing through a window and running into Bird. Bird attacks with punches and kicks, which Batman is simply too worn out to stop. He says that he told Bane that Batman ran Gotham. At the mention of his name, Bruce loses it. He beats Bird severely, screaming Bane's name as he had predicted he would. It's all a blur from here getting home on autopilot and only putting a robe over the batsuit before ascending the stairs. He promised Alfred he wouldn't wear it upstairs. He finds Alfred unconscious but alive, and Bane waiting in the heart of Wayne Manor. Nightfall, Part 11. The Broken Bat. Feel so bad. I want to die. And now, he's here, in Wayne Manor. Bane, ready and willing to grant my wish. You, you know who I, you could be no one else. This Bruce Wayne is nothing but a mask, and one which no longer serves any purpose. Although my mask, <laughs> still does. A direct feed through the helmet and straight into my brain and bloodstream, burning my veins with a very special potion. The Venom Derivative. 
Venom, yes. You found some, no doubt, pumped into the Riddler. And you are familiar with Venom? Yes. Then you know what it can do. All too well. You think so? I think not. I was once made a guinea pig for an experimental improved concentrate of Venom. Trust me, no matter what your prior experience, you know nothing of my Venom. The sheer strength and ferocity now coursing through me is enough to break a man, any man, like a dead stick. How did you know? I've known you since I lived in the hell of a dark hole thousands of miles from here. I've known you in my dreams. And I escaped from that hell, escaped from my dreams, for one reason only. To find you, and to break you. Why? What has it all been about? Freeing the inmates from Arkham? Watching me deal with them? Watching them wear me down? Was it all just to learn about me? To weaken me? There must be more to it. But what? Gotham. The ultimate prize. You have it. I want it. And all the deaths? All the wasted lives? It's been nothing but that? You'd kill just to rule this city? Just for... I'd kill for anything. I'd kill to silence a grating voice. To darken the light and eyes that dare look at me. Then, while you revel in it, Bane, I'm sick of death. Sick of blood. Sick of the chaos and horror you brought to Gotham. And right into my home. I've spent my life fighting your kind of madness and evil. And now that lifelong fight has brought me to death's door. My own door. I would not be here were it otherwise. I realize that. And I realize you may well be the single greatest source of madness and evil I've ever faced. Easily. And in that case, one more time. But this time is different. This time is doomed. Pushing too hard for too long. Facing the madness of too many masks. Bearing the brunt of too much violence. Sir, are, are you... Go, Alfred. Get out of here before... Ah, uh, sir. In too much pain. Already burned down and out from ends in every angle. Battered, bashed, and scarred from a thousand cuts and blows. Tottering on brittle bones and lurching through vertigo for months now. Sir. Ears buzzing and ringing. Everything too bright and glittery even in the dark. Too much punishment, overwhelming odds, passing blood for weeks, racing for death my whole life. Got to get help. Every muscle sluggish, sluggish and trembling, all strength stretched and sapped, washed in weakness, mired in a slow-motion panic of helplessness, and through it all, no sleep, no rest. Even when movement in self was impossible, nothing but the mind's desperate urge to get off the floor and strike back. Even when every uphill effort is wasted and futile, you are already broken. Reality itself smashed and splintered like the rude death of an impossible dream. Awakening again and again to nothing but agony, relentless and repeated. And then, the crowning horror of shattered Arkham spilling its mad guts into the long, dark night of hopeless horror. Tim! A legion of crazed killers loosed on Gotham, too many and too much to fight. It is over. You are nothing. The toll too great. Pride no longer an asset, only prelude to a fall, leaving me drained and depleted. A disappointment! Utterly empty. But still they loomed and lunged from the dark, laughing demons with bad intent, bearing pain and nothing more, chipping away at whatever was left, wearing me down toward nothing. Still not home, even at night, and nowhere. Vertigo, whirling out of control now, time distorted, images flashing, then and now a confused blur. Why don't you fight? Every shock and concussion the same, each devastating, and all adding up to one long plunge into hell. Nightmarish, 
You've got no spine! Never ending. Garish and bizarre. Insanity too stark to suffer or surmount. All of them. They all had a hand in it. But it was Bane's bloody hand behind them. Behind it all. Bane from the beginning. And Bane now at the end. No. Can't give in. Not now. No matter how hurt. Can't let him win. Can't surrender to the blessed relief of ending it all. Jason. Robin. Tim. Help, Tim. Timothy, thank God we've got to... Alfred, what happened? Your head. Never mind that, Tim. The master needs help and it's bad. We must get Jean Paul and... What? Keep your voice down, Alfred, before you wake Dad. How bad? I don't know, lad, but we... We may need an ambulance. I... I'll get my costume. Harsh tang of brimstone expanding in my chest. Every breath hot and bitter, but I can't give in. Got to try, even with no more spring in my step. No bite of boot into ground. No more power. You have nothing! No more speed. No more reflexes. Ah! That's... It gave my all long ago, and what's left uh, isn't enough. Not when I've already taken more damage than any man can endure, all in a losing cause. And now, feel so bad, I want to die. Beg for mercy! Scream my name! Go back to hell! And I'm done. I am Bane, and I could kill you. But death would only end your agony and silence your shame. Instead, I will simply break you. Broken and done. Nightfall, Part 12. Who Ruled the Night? Bane lifts the broken body of Batman high above the streets of Gotham and boasts that the city is his. He says Batman is no more, he has destroyed him, and that he now rules Gotham. He tells him to take their hero and protector and bury him, and he throws Batman down. He bounces off rooftops and awnings, breaking his fall. Batman lies broken and bleeding on the streets of the city he gave everything to protect. The police arrive and keep the crowd away. Batman is mostly unresponsive, but alive. An ambulance arrives, Alfred and Robin in disguise, and Batman is loaded onto a gurney and taken away. Jean Paul drives as Alfred examines Bruce. He's in shock, has a great deal of blood loss and internal injuries, and his back may be broken. Robin wants to take Bruce to the hospital, but Alfred insists they're going back to the cave. Robin says they have to save his life. But Alfred knows that the only life that matters to him is his life as Batman. If they take him to a hospital, his identity will be exposed. They'd save his body, certainly, but they would be killing the man. So they'll get him stabilized in the cave until they can plausibly explain how Bruce Wayne suffered these injuries. Robin agrees. Joker and Scarecrow see what has happened on the news, and Joker's delighted, reveling in Batman's pain. Scarecrow is angry, he needed the ransom from the mayor for his experiments, and they have nothing to show for their, all their efforts. He's been threatening Joker with his fear gas the whole partnership, and he finally unleashes it. It has no effect, however. Perhaps Joker is always living with his worst fears, or perhaps he truly fears nothing. Joker smashes a chair on Scarecrow and abandons their budding friendship. Bruce is bandaged in a hospital bed in the Batcave, equipped with everything a hospital would have for just this sort of situation. He's stable and his pulse is getting stronger, but his temperature is high and he's still comatose. His fever won't go down without a special drug to reduce the swelling in his spinal tissue, one they don't have in the cave. Bruce needs Decadron, and he needs it in the next hour. Without it, even if he does awaken, he'll be paralyzed for life. Racing in the Batmobile, Asriel tells Robin to prepare for the worst, but he won't hear of it. Robin says there will always be a Batman. Always. Commissioner Gordon waits by the bat signal, hoping for any word on his friend. Later, Robin comes to his office. He tells him they need Decadron and fast. 
a few calls and Gordon arranges for Bullock and Montoya to secure the drug. They race to a hospital and grab a case from an orderly outside, then they drive to a location and place it in the open. Adriel nabs it with a grappling hook and they speed back to the cave to deliver the drug. Now comes the hardest part for anyone as a loved one in this condition. The waiting. Showcase 93 is an annual book published by DC containing several stories of various characters. Issues 7 and 8 tell a story that occurred three weeks earlier in which Batman takes down Two-Face. It's okay, but you can get the trade if you really want to read it. Only two pages occur in the present and they'll be my focus. I just don't like it being placed here for pacing reasons. Alfred assures Robin they've done all they can. The Decadron is the only drug effective against severe spinal trauma, and it is their only hope. Robin blames himself for not helping Bruce on a case from three weeks earlier, when he obeyed Batman's command to stay out of danger, perhaps for too long. Batman had been kidnapped by Two-Face and held in a kangaroo court, his twisted idea of justice, but Robin came in time to save him in the end. Bruce awakens from his coma and tells Robin he didn't mean it when he said he used bad judgment. They're all just happy he's awake and that he'll live. Nightfall, Part 15, Nights in Darkness. Bruce has awakened from his coma, but his spirit is broken. Bane has beaten him, and Gotham is his. The thugs of Gotham are still reeling from the news of Batman's public defeat at Bane's hands. Bane is making his move to control the underworld, killing mob bosses and commandeering their organizations across the city. After the show he put on, no one is arguing. Bruce is reeling himself, the memory of his defeat fresh in his mind. Bane seems like an unstoppable monster to him. When Alfred informs him that his spine is broken, Bruce says that Bane didn't just beat him, he destroyed him. Bane's army of killers grows through violence in the streets. Any who will not join him die. Robin can't stand to see Bruce like this, but Alfred says they can't imagine what he's been through. He needs help, though, and they decide to bring in Dr. Chandra Kinsolving to give Bruce full-time care. The gangland violence continues to erupt across the city while Jean, Tim, and Alfred carefully move Bruce upstairs. Alfred and Robin need a way to explain Bruce Wayne's injuries, so they smash up his Porsche and roll it off a cliff. They work out their story and call Chandra. The police can already see Gotham falling into chaos without a Batman to serve as a psychological deterrent against the flood of crime. Alfred swears Chandra to secrecy on the basis of Wayne's finances being affected, and presents her with all the equipment Bruce Wayne will need, as well as the offer to obtain anything else. She agrees to be his private doctor. Meanwhile, Catwoman falls into a trap. Bane's henchmen planted a story to lure her here, but all they want is an audience. She's the only one he's playing nice with, for whatever reason. Bruce awakens to Chandra impulsively kissing him. She apologizes, but he returns her feelings. It's the first good thing he's felt in too long. After examining him, Chandra knows he's lying about the car accident. That wouldn't cause the type of injury he has, but she's glad he's lying about it. His clinging to his mystery proves he hasn't given up and on the long road ahead, he'll need that spirit. Tim tells Bruce that things are really bad in the city, and Bruce agrees that someone should fill in as Batman. Tim asks if he should go to Nightwing, Dick Grayson, but Bruce says he's his own man now, with his own responsibilities. The only other choice is Gene Paul, but Bruce insists that under no circumstances should he confront Bane, who's reveling in his power as Gotham burns. Robin comes to Gene Paul Valley and presents him with the mantle of the bat, and a costume fitted for him. Robin explains that psychologically Gotham needs the Batman back in action. The idea is to convince him that he's back and it's the same person in the suit. Batman has worked long to convince the underworld he might have supernatural powers like many heroes do, and this would only help that illusion. The criminals have to fear him. It's what keeps the city under some form of control. Gene Paul says he'll be an even better Batman than Bruce, but Robin warns him not to face Bane. Catwoman answers Bane's summons, and he politely asks her to fence all her stolen goods through his organization from now on, and he may sometimes request her for surveillance work. He offers to pay her well for her services. She agrees easily enough, but trusts that Selina will always look out of herself first in any situation. Back at Wayne Manor, Bruce has been thinking about telling Chandra everything. Trusting her fully might aid his recovery. For too long, his life has been nothing but hate and violence, with no love or tenderness. Alfred warns against it, knowing it could complicate his life as Batman. Alfred still knows that's Bruce's true self. Gordon waits by the bat signal, and finally his faith is rewarded when Batman and Robin appear. 
Robin warns Jean Paul to stick to the shadows and use a gravelly voice. Batman tells the commissioner he's not quite what he was, but he'll get there, and then Bane will have hell to pay. Bruce lies in bed watching the bat signal and thinking maybe Alfred's wrong about telling Sean for everything. Nightfall, Part 16. Lightning changes. Everything's the same and everything's different. Batman and Robin are outnumbered by hoods in the middle of a break-in, but the guy in the costume isn't Bruce Wayne. The criminals are in overtime since Batman's public fall. Batman punches the thug's lights out as Robin ducks a hammer and the thug swinging it hits his friend instead. Paul's doing a good job of filling in. He's quick and tough and scary, but somehow scary in all the wrong ways. Robin jump kicks the hammer goon as Batman smashes one's head into a dumpster and backfists another. Jean Paul terrifies another hammer wielding thug into handing over his weapon, then seems about to hit him with it anyway. Robin thinks Jean is starting to scare him. Robin restrains him and the thug runs away. Jean Paul says he's not the student anymore, he was chosen for this role and he's gonna do it his way. Robin says the method matters, the ends don't justify the means. He wonders if Ruth made a mistake. Jean challenges him to tell on him and takes off, telling Robin he's free to stay behind. Bruce tries to reach Dr. Kinsolving, and her exchange informs him she's at Jack Drake's house, which is next door. He decides to go over alone. Alfred is enjoying the first decent sleep he's had in days. Chandra is also treating Jack Drake's paralysis. Robin's father was injured years ago in the same incident which killed his mother. His housekeeper leaves for the day, failing to notice the armed and masked men in the hall. Bruce wheels up the drive, having resolved to tell Chandra the truth about his life as Batman when he spots a guard outside. He suspects this isn't random, but the work of Bane. Bane, however, is busy controlling all of Gotham's criminal activity. Everything that is, except the unions. The construction, truck, and trade unions are the most lucrative rackets, and they've managed to remain free of Bane's influence. Out on patrol, Robin is starting to feel useless as Jean steamrolls ahead. He finds it pointless to intimidate street-level thugs, and he's going to the top, a big meeting of all the mob bosses. Robin warns him that Bane is at the top, and he's supposed to stay away, but Jean Paul isn't listening. Bruce is far from helpless in his wheelchair, and he lures the guard into the foliage and knocks him out with a branch. In his weakened state, it takes several hits. Exhausted from taking out the one guard, Bruce continues up the drive, only to find a van and several more armed men. One is escorting Chandra outside. Tough Tony Bressy isn't talking tough now, asking his compatriots to side with Bane. Gene figures that's enough of a lead, and he drops in the skylight alone. The men at Jack Drake's house see Bruce and run towards him. Chandra pleads with them for his life. Bruce grabs one man's gun and pushes his mask to a side to blind him, then hits his nose with a palm strike. Gene Paul misses Robin's warning, too busy intimidating the mobsters. Robin takes out the gunman at its back, flipping across the table to dodge gunfire. It's not good. They're supposed to work as a team. Robin is just thinking this is more hood than he'd ever tackle on his own. Well, almost never. When Gene takes off after Tony, leaving him alone. Robin debates whether to tell Bruce about tonight, but decides he has enough problems of his own. Which he does. Bruce is knocked out of his chair by a thug, but they don't want to waste time on someone who's not a threat. Still, the thug kicks Bruce in the face, repaying him for his nose, and they leave. Bruce tries to memorize the license plate, but he feels that he's failed everyone. First Jason, then Gotham, and now Chandra. Alfred rushes to him as he lays on the lawn. Batman knocks a thug off a high walkway as he rushes after Tony. He barely catches the railing, and luckily Robin saves him with a line. Gene is dangerous and out of control. There's nothing Robin can do about it. Batman interrogates Tony while holding him over the edge of the walkway. Robin says that's not how they do things, but Gene tells him that maybe they should start right now, and he didn't ask for Robin's help. Tony breaks down and tells Batman that Bane has his kids. Gene Paul tells Robin that he wears a suit and so he makes a decision and that Bane is his alone. He wasn't worth bothering with before and he plans to show Bane he was wrong to underestimate him. Robin can either help or stay out of the way. Nightfall, Part 17, The Venom Connection Batman beats Tony Bressy to force him to agree to his plan while Robin tries to stop him. The whole idea of the Batman-Robin team has become a bad joke. Gene is out of control and Robin can't say much in front of Tony without spoiling the illusion. Gene's plan is to keep the mob bosses captive for long enough that Tony can convince Bane they're folding and he can get his kids back. In the Batcave, Bruce is determined to rescue Chandra Kinsolving and Jack Drake. 
He analyzes the blood on the mask left behind and finds that the man has been vaccinated against malaria. Bane is furious at the reports of Batman's return. He says that he broke the bat. That is nothing but an imposter. He will crush this pretender. Tony Bressy makes contact and tells Bane the unions are his and asks for his kids back. Bird suggests the new Batman might be squeezing Bressy, so Bane sends his henchmen to return the children. Bruce attempts to trace the specific strain of malaria he found while Robin mulls over telling Bruce about Jean Paul. They really don't know what effect the system is having on him, that his father Azrael was a killer. Again though, he decides that Bruce has enough problems of his own. Oracle reports back to Batman the malaria strain is found in Santa Prisca, a small island nation in South America, the place where Venom comes from. She tells Bruce also to keep heart, being in a chair can be difficult. Seems that Oracle knows everything. Just then, the Batmobile enters the Batcave. It's strange for Bruce to see Batman coming home, but he tells Jean the cave is now his. Everything is going well, Bruce says, the reported drop in crime means the plan is working. He warns Jean Paul to keep it that way and avoid confronting Bane. He suspects Bane may even be leaving, and Bruce is going to check that possibility out. He asks Batman to keep Gotham under control. After Bruce and Alfred leave, a hypnotic trance comes over Jean Paul Valley, and he begins automatic writing. When finished, he finds he had designed something. Jean goes looking for Bruce's mute helper, Harold, but cannot find him. Still, he thinks he can build these himself with what's in the cave. Batman tries out his new gauntlets, complete with razor-sharp claws, to pick up Tony Bressy's message. Tony's note tells him where and when the kids are being returned, and Batman says it's his chance to get Bane. Robin tries one last time to talk to him, telling Jean he's trying to smash his way to the goal like the ones are trying to stop, but Jean isn't listening. He says that Bruce chose him, and Robin says that was a mistake. Robin says maybe he's not good enough to do it the right way, and Jean gets offended. His intensity is scary. He's still sore about Bane overlooking him at the croc fight. Batman charges off, leaving Robin behind. Meanwhile, Bruce and Alfred book a private plane to Santa Prisca, and one Miss Selina Kyle attempts to board as well, but Alfred turns her away. Zombie pushes Tony's kids at him, and Batman drops down from the rafters while they're still in the crossfire. Robin's warning falls on deaf ears as Batman tears into the thugs like a demon, taking out Zombie first. He slashes Trog's face with his claws as Robin protects the kids. Batman kicks Trog and pins Bird to some crates with shurikens fired from his new gauntlets. He slashes the Falcon's wing. Robin can't believe he helped train Gene, seeing how he operates. Batman ducks Trog's punch and backhands it with the heavy gauntlet, ending the fight. He tries to begin interrogating them, but they're all out cold. Robin asks him about the kids, but Batman says he saw Robin coming. He knew he'd protect them while the heat was on him. He says it's a new game now, with no time for kid gloves. Robin tries to mention the gloves, but the police are arriving and they must leave. Even if he did trust Robin with the kids, and it did all work out, he's going to run into Bane eventually, and he can't let that happen. Robin resolves to tell Bruce, but he finds only Jean in the cave. Jean tells Tim that Bruce and Alfred had gone on their trip and told him to move in. Jean Paul apologizes for their argument. Out of the costume, he's much more reasonable. It's like it does something to him. He says he's going to design some new improvements to the costume, and Robin should go home before he's missed. Meanwhile, Alfred discovers Selina has stowed away on the plane. Tim Drake comes home to an empty house and a note from Alfred promising that he and Bruce will find his father, and asking him to take care of Jean Paul. Nightfall, Part 18, The Devil You Know the new Batman grapples around Gotham with hooks fired from his gauntlets. The mantle of the Bat is his. Bane must fall if Gotham is to be his as well. Bane still rules the night for now, but he'll find the monster, and then it will all be his. The night, the city, everything. The detective work bores him, so he goes to Commissioner Gordon's office. He asks Gordon what the police have learned from Bane's henchmen, but they've said nothing. He tells Batman where they're being held. And when he turns around, fully expecting Batman to have silently vanished on him, he's shocked to find Batman still there. Usually he disappears, but Batman says he wasn't sure they were done talking. Jim says that never stopped him before. Batman says he'll take care of finding Bane, and the less Jim knows, the better. Apparently, he says. Bane's henchmen sit in prison awaiting Bane's rescue when a bag with gas mask and a lockpick drops into their cell with a note from B to watch and wait. Gas grenades drop in and put the police out. A ladder drops down to allow them to escape the building. Back at Bane's hideout, his men congratulate him on a brilliant escape plan, and he informs them it was not him. 
If not him, then who, they ask, and he calls them all idiots. Suddenly a flashbang takes out the window and Batman makes a dramatic entrance. He quickly takes out the henchman, leaving only Bane, whose name he growls. Bane tackles him, calling him a pretender. Batman knees Bane in the chin, saying he's the only Batman Bane needs to worry about. Bane says he's nothing, and he'll destroy him even easier than he did Bruce Wayne. Gene says he didn't come to Gotham for Wayne, he came for Batman, and now the mantle is his. And this time, he's not facing a man at the end of his endurance. This Batman is ready for him, and he fires shurikens at Bane, who ducks behind a couch. Bane triggers his venom feed. Bane hurls the couch at Batman, knocking him out of the window. Bane grabs a stunned Batman by the throat and chokes him over the ledge of the motel's high floor, yelling that the mantle of the bat will be a funeral shroud. Gene digs his claws into Bane's thigh and gets some breathing room. Still, he underestimated him and realizes now the danger he's in. He slashes Bane's chest with his claws, angering him. Bane calls him an animal and backhands Batman off the high floor into the central courtyard, and Batman fires a grappling hook and swings to a rafter. Bane follows him to the narrow ledge. Gene Paul asks Bane why he has it in for Batman. They have no apparent history. Bane says it was enough for Bruce to know they were opposites, but if this Batman is curious, he can bark his questions in hell, and he kicks at Batman, who drops down to avoid it. He says he's fast, Wayne trained him well, and Gene says he wasn't trained, he was born for this role, and he kicks Bane in the head and slashes him again. Bane catches his next kick, saying he was damned to his role. The world is his prison, and he will rule it or die. Batman handspring kicks Bane, saying that that will be his sentence, death. Bane laughs, saying he is different from Wayne. First he brought ruin to Wayne, and now this neophyte brings ruin to the Batman. Gene screams no and tackles Bane off the rafters toward a window washing cart. They smash into it and Gene bounces off, a rope twisted around his ankle saving him from falling. Bane says that even in his weakened condition, Bruce lasted longer than this, and he digs a shuriken out of his arm and begins to cut the rope. This was a foil cover, and it was really hard to find a picture that was visible. I wish this was my signed copy. The cover folds out to reveal the new Batsuit. Nightfall, Part 19, Dark Angel, Chapter 1, The Fall. Batman hangs by his leg from a rope, which Bane is about to cut. He fires more shurikens at Bane, driving him back. He tries to pull himself up, but the frayed rope snaps. Batman begins to fall. He kicks the rope free and fires his grapnel. It catches poorly, but it breaks his fall as Batman slams into the wall. The grapnel pulls free and he feels the line go slack. As he slides down the wall, he has one last chance and kicks off of the wall. Gene cannonballs from maximum distance, the cape slowing his progress, a hindrance. Batman barely makes it to the fountain in the courtyard, saving his life, but smashing his leg on the edge. Bane kicks in a window and runs for it. Gene Paul climbs out of the fountain, but Bane has too much of a lead to be caught, and Batman's leg is too numb to run. Bane escapes through the crowd. As he leaves, a security guard is startled by Batman's claws. Robin finds Gene Paul in the Batcave working out. He again tries to talk sense to him about his brutal way of doing things. Gene says he'll preserve decency, but he doesn't need it, and he may not use it. Robin says then he's not preserving it. Gene says he's saving the city, not himself. There's no more room for honor. The fight has changed. Robin says the old Batman would never sink to the level of the ones he fights, Gene replies that he was created for older times. Evil has lost its patience. Bruce was a dark knight, but this is no jousting tournament. Gene doesn't play games. He says that chivalry is nothing but a handicap. If he's to have any chance, he has to be darker than the darkness he faces. Robin says if he fights fire with fire, he'll be just like Bane. Gene says maybe so, and maybe Gotham will fear him and hate him when he's done, but it will work. He will save Gotham at the cost of his own soul. He says that Bane crippled the city, and when you're hurt that bad, maybe you'll accept any medicine. The old Batman is broken and gone. It's time for something new. Robin says that he can count him out, and Gene says he already has. Bane is too dangerous for him. Robin leaves, and Gene begins drawing more designs. The gloves are adequate, but the cape almost killed him. He enters the trance of the system again, and when he emerges, he will be changed. The mayor is on board with this new version of Batman, seeing how effective he is at curtailing crime, especially now that he's stared that evil in the face himself. Jim Gordon's not so sure, however, and he wonders what's happened to his friend. Something is different. Something has changed. 
Back in the cave, Jean finds Harold still gone and sets about building his new costume. Here in the cold rocks, he will find the heat to forge something new. He also breaks the security cameras mounted in the cave for privacy. Ace the Bathound does not approve, and he slinks off into the depths of the cave. Ace and Harold have stashed themselves away deep in the caves with food stocked up for a long wait. Jean Paul works like a man possessed. Robin has called Nightwing for her advice, and he explains the situation to him. Tim tells Dick that Bruce is out of danger but still in a wheelchair. He's gone on a trip, and Jean Paul has replaced him as Batman. Dick asks why Bruce didn't ask him, and Robin asks if he would have wanted the job. Dick says no, but he would have done it. Bruce wanted to let him have his own life, though, beyond his shadow. Robin expresses his concerns that Jean is too violent and brutal. He explains about Azrael and the system, its full effects still unknown to them. Dick simplifies the matter, saying either he's good enough or he's not. It was Bruce's decision, and there's nothing they can do about it. Bruce thinks he's good enough, so that's it. Robin wants to give it one last try, though. Bane finds a hidden cache of venom and prepares for the final battle. Bane kills an electric sign operator and uses it to send Batman a challenge. Robin finds the Batcave empty, and when he sees the design for Jean Paul's new costume, he can't believe what he's seeing. Chapter 2 The Descent Somehow the night has become a vast ocean through which he swims, buoyed and weightless above a gothic Atlantis drenched in dark wonder and secret sin. It is a place long since cursed by a flood from heaven and forsaken by true light. A dark angel on spread wings, he falls closer to the core, the only one willing to descend deeper. All pain and stiffness washed away by the sea, lost in a part of his mind he no longer knows as he searches for a sign. And my message is, Batman, now. The ocean recedes now, displaced by a bracing wind. It clears his mind of the dreamlike sleep. He is alert now, out of the ocean, out of the cocoon, a new creature drying in the biting air. His new cape grabs the wind, swelling on its lip, no longer a hindrance. He hears it as he glides, softly at first, distant and echoing, haunting. When it rises, a sound not unlike a woman's voice, keening higher and louder and closer until it fills his heart with its unearthly thrill. It is the wild knight, screaming for his soul. He rides it. Everything is bright and glittery now, a million lights shimmering through a wind whipping straight to hell or salvation. He doesn't care which. He just wants an end or a beginning. Something. Anything. As long as it is hard, fresh, and final. He is still high on the creation, stretching out to fill this new thing he has fashioned without thinking, somehow knowing it is right. Feeling like a black comet slashing the sky, scattering stars in his wake. It is a thing born only when nothing else matters, filling him now, even as he rides it harder, a perfect cast, forged in a fire he never felt. He only feels larger, stronger. He touches another creation, one which has not felt a hand in a hundred years. He wishes it would take flight for the sheer thrill of chasing it. He knows his mind has been violated by the system, but he does not care. The wild knight still screams for whatever he has become, shaped by unseen hands for undreamed purpose. And for his own reasons, he is willing clay. It waits for him out there, the brood demonic force which smashed the old and created the new. It holds an end, promising a beginning, one for each of them. He wonders where and the city becomes a puzzle, one piece the key unlocking the collective prize of the whole. Find that piece, and the puzzle is his, its meaning revealed, the prize claimed. And even though that piece is but one of millions, it is the dark heart shading the whole. It is Bane. The key is Bane. Find him. Remove him. Take his place. And become a darker heart, feeding the rest, the new center holding it all. There. Rain. Rain makes it perfect. The flood from heaven. Beginning anew, and now for real. Batman projects his altered bat symbol from a chest light, answering Bane's challenge, and Bane smashes through the sign. He lands on a car, ready for battle. The police have a shot, but they also have orders to wait unless things get out of control. Batman approaches Bane, whether it's his end or his beginning. Gordon notices the quote marks on the sign around the word Batman and wonders what happened to his costume. The police can't hear the conversation as Bane tells Jean Paul he's just an imposter in a fancy new costume. And that's all he is. A costume. 
Batman says he's not like the old Batman. He's a lot like Bane himself, only he stopped his fall just short of the bottom. Bane says that Gotham is his, in his pocket, and Batman says prepare to be mugged. He fires several shurikens into Bane's arm. Batman jumps in and kicks Bane in the face, following his slashes from his claws. Bane flips away and goes for his venom feed. Bane feeds his muscles with the venom and charges at Batman, tackling to the ground and raining down heavy punches. He continues to ground and pound Batman until he responds with his ultra-bright chest light, driving Bane back. He kicks Bane off him and they rise, begin trading blows toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Bane goes for more venom, but Batman slashes the pipe in his mask, denying him his crutch. Bane kicks wildly, driving Batman back but not hurting him. He screams that he already won! He broke the Batman! Gene says, not this Batman. He fires more shurikens at Bane, who flees, running for the elevated train tracks. Batman gets there too late. Bane is already on the train as it leaves. He fires his grapnel and catches the train, but the momentum is too much for the grapnel's retractor to overcome. Batman simply digs in with his claws and hauls his way along the train. Bane demands everyone leave the front car as Batman reaches the front window. Bane throws the operator out of the front of the train and cranks the speed to the max. Too late, though, as Batman enters through the broken window. Batman tackles Bane and they fight in the close quarters of the train car. He punches Bane with his claws and knees him in the groin. On the ground, Harvey Bullock sees the train is going far too fast to make the upcoming turn as a right angle as the train follows the streets. Robin gives chase. Robin reaches the train as Bane and Jean Paul continue to fight inside. Batman catches Bane's fists and smashes his head through a window. Robin blows up the train connector, detaching the lead car and saving the people on the rest of the train. The lead car goes even faster with no load to pull as it nears the curve. The train car jumps off the tracks and flies through the air, smashing into a building as Bane and Batman are tossed about inside. The train car falls back out of the building and lands vertically on the street as Batman swings off a rail inside and kicks Bane out of it with both legs. Batman leaps down to Bane and picks him up. Bane is done fighting back, and it seems like Batman is about to kill him. Robin and Gordon look on in fear of what might happen. Bane asks Batman to kill him, but he refuses and drops him, saying that now Bane is broken and Blackgate Prison can hold the pieces. Gordon thinks maybe it still is the man he knew, and Robin cheers Jean's decision. Maybe there's hope for this new Batman after all. After the police take Bane away, Robin comes to Jean Paul and apologizes. Maybe he was wrong about him. He has a different way of doing things, sure, but as long as he has some restraint, maybe it'll all work out. He says Gene has earned the right to wear that costume, that he is the Batman. Gene thanks him and he heads off into the night, a darker night on a new quest. The End Following this comes Night Quest, which is split into two parts. Night Quest the Crusade, dealing Gene Paul's career in Gotham as the new Batman, and Night Quest the Search, concerning Bruce's world-spanning adventure to rescue Jack Drake and Dr. Chandra Kinsolving. And following that the conclusion, Night's End in which a healed and renewed Bruce Wayne must return to Gotham and retake the mantle of the Bat by fighting Gene Paul. But first, he must relearn everything he knows about being Batman. I don't know if that's what I'll adapt immediately after this. There's a lot of Batman on this channel already, and I'd like to do some other heroes like Superman and Green Lantern, but I promise it will come someday and pretty soon, and it's all interesting. Night's End in particular is fantastic. But hey, if you don't want to wait, just get the comics arena for yourselves.